If you ever have a need to encode two numbers into just one value, you may find pairing functions of use. Another way of explaining the use of pairing functions is to say that they can describe points on a 2D plane with only one coordinate, as opposed to a pair of coordinates. If I draw a blank grid and put someone on the spot to label every point on this grid with one coordinate, I'd imagine a fair amount of people would immediately start to count along the x-axis on the bottom. As they were doing this task, they would soon realise that at some point they would need to start labelling the upper rows. Different pairing functions take different approaches to navigating and labelling this grid. In this video, I'm going to use Python to program the Cantor pairing function and Sudzik's elegant pairing function. Cantor's is the first I came across and has a nice intuitive encoding pattern. However, Sudzik's pairing function is in my opinion better because it has more efficient value packing. What this means is that the encoded value will be lower than that of the Cantor pairing function. This is useful to avoid overflow errors. Before I explain either function, I'm going to write this boilerplate code to get some input. Cantor's pairing function makes use of triangular numbers. The triangular numbers sequence represents the number of dots needed to form equilateral triangles of increasing size. Another way of conceptualizing the sequence is that each number is the sum of all the previous numbers. The formula for computing this number is x multiplied by x plus 1 all over 2. Now to write the pairing function, we're just going to find the triangular number of the sum of the pair of coordinates and then we'll add the y value so we get unique values at every point. Redrawing the blank grid and filling it in with all the encoded values that this function returns, you can start to see a pattern emerge. I can draw arrows between all consecutive values to illustrate that the function works diagonally up and left and then back to the next value on the x-axis when it hits the y-axis. Now, to invert the Cantor pairing function, we're going to calculate two values, a and b, which will decode the value. If we expand that triangular number formula, we can see that the triangular number is equal to the sum squared plus the sum all over 2. Now, if we make this equation equal to 0, we're left with a quadratic equation, which, if solved for sum as a function of the triangular number, leaves us with sum equals root 8t plus 1 minus 1 all over 2. So, when inverting the function, we can put z into this equation, and since we know that z is the triangular number plus the y value, the y value must be z minus the triangular number. Similarly, because we know that the sum is x plus y, x must be the sum minus y. Finally, we're left with complete encoding and decoding functions, which allow us to store all positive integer pairs as a single unique integer. We can check our output against this grid, which shows us what the encoding should look like. Now let's check out Suzik's elegant pairing function, which takes up fewer lines of code, but perhaps is a bit harder to explain. In the encoding function, we're just going to use a ternary operator to say that if x is greater than or equal to y, we return x squared plus x plus y, otherwise return y squared plus x. Now we're going to define two variables, a and b. a is going to be floor root z, and b will be z minus a squared. Looking at the pairing function, imagine we return y squared plus x. To find out what y is, we can square root the value, which should be y squared plus something, to find y plus a little bit. Then we can floor the value to round down to the nearest whole number, thereby removing that little bit which represents x. Finally, we'll just return a and b in the right order depending on which value is higher. Now if we run this script, we'll see that everything is encoded and decoded as expected. According to the grid, everything is correct and we get the added benefit of our values being lower than those output by the Cantor pairing function. Now I'm going to show one extra version of this pairing function, which has the useful benefit of working with negative integers as well. The basic methodology is that we make positive numbers even and negative numbers odd. Instead of working with x and y in the encoding function, we need to work with a and b. If x is positive, we'll just times it by 2 so that we know it's even. However, if it's negative, we can multiply it by negative 2 so that it becomes positive and also even. But then we'll minus it by 1 so that it's always odd. We do the exact same for y. Next, in the unpairing function, instead of immediately returning the result, we just store the result as the variable r, and then we can undo the transformation we did in the encoding function based on whether the value is even or not. Finally, we can test this version of our pairing function, and we see that it does indeed work as before, but also with negative numbers. The only problem is that our packing efficiency is less because we're now working with positive and negative inputs, but with still only positive outputs. 
If you're going to make use of a pairing function, one optimization you may want to consider is making your inputs as small as possible. Say you're encoding positions on a 32 by 32 grid. You could divide all your values by 32 before encoding them and then just multiply them after. Another scenario is that if you know all your values will be over a certain value, you can minus that value before encoding it and add it back after. With that said, that's it for this video. I hope it's been interesting and informative. If you have any questions or thoughts, definitely leave a comment below about the video, about my code, or with any ideas for future topics. Also, if you want to see more kinds of these videos, please leave a like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. I'll see you in the next video.